This, these studies include patients with, with diabetes with uh, gastric bypass or gastric sleeve surgery, uh, plus the look ahead study, which was a very intensive lifestyle intervention. And you can see that it's a common observation that everything goes down when you, get, when you have a very effective treatment, but for most of them, it's going back up. Oh, by the way, this one that's completely flat here, this was the control group for the look ahead study where they did no intervention. Um, and no change in their diabetes, uh, and luckily no upward trend. But again, uh, you get a lower slope and, and better lasting results when you deal with something which is sustainable and planned to be followed long term, and that's what we do with the well-formulated ketogenic diet. And now I kind of want to pick a fight with my personal friend and colleague, Christopher Gardner at Stanford, because he published a, a, a study, a very provocative study in 2007 called um, the A to Z study, and A stood for Atkins and, and uh, Z st stood for the zone diet. They've studied four different, zone, or four different diets, but I want to highlight in the solid green at the top, um, these two bars, this was a group of patients uh, with obesity, not diabetes, who were, went through a three-month training program with something called the LEARN program that was developed by Dr. Kelly Brownell, who was an excellent, excellent um, behavioral medicine scientist at, at that time at Yale. Uh, they lost weight and they kept much of it off over the course of a year, but it was about four, three to four percent of body weight. Uh, when they did the Atkins diet, they lost more and they kept more of it off, but out here it wasn't statistically different, significantly different, so I said, see, there's no difference between these two diets. But the effects were very modest and weight regain began at six months after the Atkins diet. The orange bars, solid and, and uh, dotted here, this is a study called the Diet Fit Study that he published in 2018, uh, where they recruited uh, uh, overweight women, not with, with, not with diabetes, and half of them were given a healthy, um, low-fat diet, and half of them were given a, quote, ketogenic diet. And so the healthy, low-fat diet is in the orange right here. And see, they did better than the behavioral group here, uh, but they started gaining it at the end of the first year. Uh, this was the healthy ketogenic diet that they used, but I need to put ketogenic in air quotes because they started out at 20 grams of carbs per day. They were in a, they gave you got 22 meetings with the, the, the research dietitian over the course of a year. But by the end of the first month, they were told, we know that it's really hard to follow a 20 gram, a 20 gram carbohydrate intake diet. So you can add back carbs till you get to a point where, you can, where you're eating enough carbs that you think you can follow this for a year. And what they got was the same kind of downward curve starting back up. And when they got out here, they were eating something on the order of, I think it was 39% of their calories as carbs. And this group was eating 52% of the calories of carbs. So they differed a significant amount of carbs, but the outcomes weren't different. So the conclusion in JAMA was both diets work, but there's no difference between the two of them. But it wasn't a ketogenic diet. The biggest problems that we deal with that are easily manageable is getting people to eat enough sodium and eat enough potassium. Because if you don't, there's problems. So for sodium, if you don't eat enough sodium when you're on a ketogenic diet, because you have this naturesis of fasting, the, the kidneys losing, accelerating their loss of sodium, you will become sodium depleted and that will lead to renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone process moderated by the kidneys, you know, which leads to increased cortisol and cortisol stress. And people say, oh, well, that's the Atkins flu if you have headache and fatigue and, and uh, dizziness. And if, and if it goes on a long time and you just feel crappy all the time, they say, well, you've got adrenal fatigue. There is no medical diagnosis of adrenal fatigue. That's sodium inadequacy. It's not adrenal fatigue. And you don't wait till it happens and say, oh, we'll give them a gram of sodium or two grams today. You treat them with the sodium from day one. When we send a starter kit to the patient, we send it with their choice of a vegetarian or chicken bouillon. 
actually one of each, because they, they taste it and find out what they want to buy. We have to give them the stuff to start with to get them to, under, to, to take it and understand that it's necessary. Is that safe? Well, there's an amazing study published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2014 by a group at McMaster University in Ontario, Canada. But they, the study was from 100,000, 102,000 people uh, from 17 countries. What this shows is the mortality curve for the measured so sodium excretion as a surrogate for sodium intake. And this is the 2.3 grams that we're all told we should be eating. And you can see that the mortality risk here is 1.5 times the lowest point, which is at, between, is at between four and five grams of sodium per day. So for healthy populations, the healthiest sodium intake across seven different countries is between four and five grams of sodium per day. And if you eat more than that, you can see the curve as it goes out to the, the right doesn't go up very fast, but it goes up really fast if you severely restrict sodium. So sodium is absolutely necessary.